Anwar Hidwani, or Hidnavi, sorry about that. Uh, she, who is a research group leader at ETH Zurich, uh, where she leads the Privacy Preserving Systems Lab. She works at the intersection of systems, data privacy, and applied cryptography. And she's going to talk about uh, how uh, applications of this uh, to collaborative learning. Thank you for the introduction and also for having me here. Um, so today we'll talk about um, the security and robustness challenges of uh, collaborative learning. But before I start, I want to uh, set the settings of the to different topics I will be covering. So in the first part of the talk, I'll give a deep dive on the robustness and security uh, challenges of collaborative learning. And my intention here is actually to motivate the role cryptography can play uh, to remedy some of the integrity and privacy issues in this learning paradigm, but also highlight the extent of which these cryptographic tools can be helpful. And in the second part, I'll just give you a flavor of, of a system that is developed in my group that actually use these cryptographic issues to help mitigate some of the integrity issues. So I'm primarily going to present Truffle, which is a work with my students, Ruffle is a secure collaborative learning system that allows clients to prove cryptographically certain properties about their contribution in order to attain some form of meaningful robustness. Something I just want to highlight before I proceed is that my background is in security and cryptography, so my talk will reflect on my understanding of all these issues from this lens. So machine learning algorithm continue to achieve remarkable uh, success in a wide range of uh, applications. Much of this success can be attributed to the availability of large domain specific data sets um, for training machine learning algorithms or models. So much of uh, most of the success we have seen in the ML space is in tasks and domains uh, where data is relatively easily accessible. This includes uh, imaging classification task and language model where we have a large public data that we could farm from the internet or even crowdsource it. But uh, many of the important questions we care about in the society touch on sensitive data. That is very, very difficult to access. And this data currently lives in silos um, that is hard to access, and also hard to compute uh, across them. But there are more and more uh, realizations uh, by both the governments and organizations that this data can actually bring many benefits to society. And uh, there is a need for both legal frameworks, but also technical solutions uh, that allow us to access this data, benefit from it, but um, preserve the privacy of users. And I, uh, when I just uh, highlight something here, because we talk about incentives as a major uh, thing in this space, I think low is also a very, very major thing. And uh, well, we don't talk too much about it because it's uh, uh, not as technical, but it's actually as important probably. And I'm, I'm happy to see, um, at least in the EU, there's a lot of activities going uh, on. Recently, the EU approved the DGA, which hopefully, is, it will be effective in 2023, but hopefully would allow scientists, given that we have the right frameworks of secure and differential private, to access some of the public data set that the government so hope this will be a game changer. But so one promising technologies for training ML models for settings of this nature is collaborative learning. So collaborative learning systems are learning systems that at the core aim to train ML models without the need to have a direct access to data. So their privacy benefits lie in the ability to retain data locally and they're attractive for scenarios where data privacy and liability is a concern. Um, yeah, and there are many flavors to collaborative learning. Probably the two prominent ones are decentralized learning and federated learning. So decentralized learning is a setup where we have um, a number of organizations that engage in a secure protocol in order to train a machine learning model based on the joint set, uh, data set. This setup is particularly appealing to uh, organizations that they want to collaborate but can't due to privacy. Um, regulations such as the financial uh, sector, but also uh, healthcare sectors. Federated learning, on the other hand, is a setup where we have a centralized service that aims to train machine learning model without needing a direct access to the training data. So the training process is distributed across uh, a large number of devices that collaborate to train a joint model through an iterative process that aggregate locally training updates. And federated learning is especially appealing for organizations that coordinate a large number of devices 
and they want to train the data in a privacy preserving uh, way. So collaborative learning system by default, they inherit all the known issues we know in the and, and security, all the privacy and security issues we know in the ML space. So simply uh, being collaborative um, does not make these systems more resilient uh, to known attacks, uh, both during the training, but also the inference time. In fact, the collaborative nature opens up new attack surfaces that are interesting to study and defend against. And this new aspect is what I will focus on primarily today. So I will start uh, by discussing the confidentiality of input data, as this is arguably one of the main reasons why one want to opt to use uh, collaborative learning. Here, data holders want assurances that data is not exposed to the cloud server, but also not to any other party that is participating in the learning uh, process. So in, in, in um, so in collaborative learning, we keep the data local, but only we exchange inferior updates necessary for training the model. So we would hope that this, you know, these updates uh, will actually prevent the cloud uh, or other parties involved in the training process from stealing sensitive in information. So though, though these updates indeed actually hold this information than the raw data, there's still high dimensional information that one can actually still extract a lot of sensitive uh, information from it. And actually, it didn't take a lot of time until people started to craft all sorts of attacks to extract uh, sensitive information, actually reconstruct even data samples of that. So people use techniques such as gradient inversion, gradient amplification, trap weights, and all sorts of other techniques in order to actually extract sensitive information from these uh, updates. So to remedy these issues, these systems generally rely on encryption. So to ensure the privacy of input data during training. So where decentralized uh, learning often is used with MPC protocol, where, um, where MPC protocol, where the, 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 and these protocols basically ensures that no input data is leaked and no also intermediate uh, um, information throughout the process is actually leaked. Um, uh, and only the final output is then revealed to the other parties. In uh, the FL space, because this is actually involved a large number of participants, MPC protocols currently cannot really scale to this type of setting. So instead we rely on a lighter version of cryptographic protocols we refer to them as secure aggregation. In this setting, so clients will actually encrypt their data or updates, send it to the server, and then the, only the aggregated sum will then be revealed to the server. They still can leak some intermediate uh, results, but, um, but it's fairly still provide a lot of privacy benefits over sending these uh, updates basically non-encrypted. So on a more general level, we have a variety of cryptographic construction that can help us mitigate different issues when it's come to the confidentiality of input data. Each of these uh, uh, construction actually offer their own traders and we need to carefully tailor these uh, construction, or oh, tailor cryptographic solution to our context, which often means that we need to understand the cost models, but also there's a need also to to readapt our application to be more cryptographic uh, friendly or cryptography friendly. So on the robustness uh, front, uh, also collaborative learning can amplify uh, adversarial robustness issues we know in the centralized setting. So several characteristics of the collaborative learning make impact of these known issues we know in the centralized settings actually worse. And these can be attributed to many issues uh, such as the open nature of these systems uh, so these, uh, these systems are, uh, often involve a large number of, of participants among whom any can be compromised and then can maliciously uh, 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 act throughout the training process. Attacker capabilities are also different. For example, the ability of the client to hold access to the model updates allow for um, novel stronger attacks such as model poisoning. So um, in addition, as the attacker actually persists throughout uh, the learning process, uh, this allows them to form adapt, uh, like a new type of attacks that is actually adaptive. So they fine tune their adapt to the stage of the learning. 
Uh, attackers in these settings are also harder to detect uh, because we rely on encryption uh, to preserve the privacy of input data. We cannot really tell from inspecting a ciphertext whether a, a particular contribution is actually malformed or, or not. Uh, so I will briefly cover, cover some of the attacks we have seen in these systems. I'll first go through some of the attacks we have seen in the federated learning uh, briefly, and then I will, um, uh, yeah. So the first one I want to cover briefly is uh, data poisoning. So what are the uh, poisoning attacks? So poisoning attacks are train time attacks. So adversary actually manipulate the training data with the hope of changing the behavior of the machine learning system. So these attacks uh, initially were actually studied in the centralized uh, machine learning setting, but they are especially concerning for collaborative learning because it takes one compromised node in the collaborative learning settings in order to embed a backdoor in, in the model. And initially these attacks were you know, very simple, used simple strategies such as label flipping, but they became more and more uh, advanced over the time. So now we have trigger-based attacks that cause a model to behave uh, maliciously once a particular trigger, uh, a, well, a specific secure trigger is present while behaving as intended uh, uh, when the trigger is absent. And these triggers are, can also done uh, by adding adversarial perturbation to the training data to ensure that the cause targeted effect that is actually difficult to detect at the test time. And federated learning is not limited to data poisoning. So they are also vulnerable to uh, poisoning attacks. So because the client now have a direct access to the model uh, parameter, uh, the adversary can craft malicious model updates directly. So one of these uh, example of these attacks is actually model replacement attacks. So the adversary injects a desired target into the model and then apply scaling to amplify its impact. But model poisoning attacks are also um, not limited to scaling, so also more advanced attacks um, in the literature work by changing the model updates or the model, the trained weights of the model uh, directly. Uh, so decentralized uh, settings um, is slightly, the situation is slightly uh, different, so model poisoning to some extent is not an issue uh, because carefully designed protocols are uh, as part of their protocol, they rely on cryptographic commitments, uh, which uh, is a cryptographic tool that ties users to their input without revealing the actual input. So parties commit to their data cryptographically and um, they can prove uh, that they use the same data set throughout the computation, which saved us uh, from a lot of adaptive attacks, but also because in MVC, we can also use security maliciously secure MVC, which also give us guarantees that we don't deviate from the computation. So it's, it's, it's not a, of a major issue in the decentralized settings if you use the right protocols. Data poisoning is, however, uh, these systems remain vulnerable to data poisoning. So defenses to adversarial robustness proposed in centralized settings are interesting for collaborative learning, but they can also be limited for several reasons. So the first direction I want to just briefly highlight is that we designed more robust ML to these poisoning attacks. And these algorithms can, the issue with these algorithms, at least the ones we design are, they generally ex exhibit high cost. They can have a, a huge amount of non-linearity. So training, um, so translating these actually uh, models to the encrypted settings can be very costly. So it would be very interesting to look at more work that looks at robust ML algorithms that is crypto friendly. The second direction is detection mechanism. Um, these often assume that you have a direct access to the uh, data or the parameter updates that you can audit in order to filter malicious input. But due to encryption, most of these solutions can't be applied in the collaborative learning settings. The last direction is on the use of cryptography. So what can cryptography play for robust ML? This is the least explored direction, but it's actually the one of the most interesting for collaborative learning because cryptographic tool can also be compatible with encryption. So we have powerful tools that we can apply here. The main issue here is that traditional verification techniques implicitly assume that there is a pre-specified function F, the evaluation of which we uh, want to verify. However, in ML, the function f is len, and we don't have a ground truth to what we want actually to verify. But we also know that um, 
Many of the adversity or robustness issues stem not from maliciously chosen input, not directly from deviating from the protocol. And the question here, can we actually verify something about the inputs that the parties provide such, that, uh, such as the input data, the data distribution, or even the submitted uh, gradients? And there are actually interesting uh, initial work in this direction by um, mainly cryptographers, uh, uh, but it would be more interesting to look uh, at more work at the intersection of cryptography and um, machine learning that is actually targeted for robustness. So let me wrap up the overview part of this talk. So by emphasizing in some of the key points, uh, and the first one I wanna highlight is that federation does not really by itself bring many privacy benefits. However, the use of these systems with encryption can elevate the bar of privacy benefit we can get from these systems. The second is that we need more work on robust ML in the encrypted settings. We need both. Uh, we need uh, to design uh, robust ML algorithms that are cryptography friendly, but also we need to see how we can actually put these very powerful cryptographic tools in place to actually help with um, robust ML. And the finally, well, it seems like a perfect solution to adversarial robustness in ML is an unattainable goal. Uh, we are now hitting another cat and mouse game uh, with, um, with data poisoning. So more powerful attacks keep surfacing um, uh, that are bound to the current attacker threat model. And there are more and more realization by the community that probably we need to go beyond attack prevention to so work on uh, risk assessment systems or majors that actually allow us to minimize the consequences of these attacks once they happen at deployment time. And my, you know, two cents in this direction for those majors, if we want to apply them for this uh, privacy sensitive application, they also need to be privacy preserving. So also from the security, security folks need to work on these majors with privacy in mind. So we don't harm the privacy of benign participants. So now I will switch and talk about uh, Rockful here. Uh, I wanna give just a flavor of how we can apply crypto verification to help with your business through just going through this system. Uh, so uh, this is a joint work with my students, Lucas, Hede, uh, Nicholas, and Alex. Uh, so Rockful is a system that allows clients to cryptographically prove certain properties or constraints um, about their encrypted contributions in order to attain some form of meaning for robustness. But to understand what type of constraints that could be helpful for robustness, we need to first uh, understand what vulnerabilities uh, these um, attackers exploit in the FL pipelines. So let's set the stage of what we are trying to understand here. So in FL, the server sends a model to the client, which compute an update based on their local uh, data set. Uh, the client then sends uh, the update to the server encrypted using secure uh, aggregation protocol. The server then aggregate these uh, updates in order to recover the aggregated updates. And the literature identified two types of attacks uh, in, on, in FL. So we have the data poisoning attack and the also model poisoning, which I briefly covered in the first part. Let's start to understand, or let's try to attempt to understand why these attacks are possible in the first place. So, um, okay, so the early type of model poisoning attacks in FL, which we refer to them in the literature as model poisoning attacks, works as follows. So the attacker first uh, trains the model using the regular optimization algorithm on both a benign and the malicious uh, sample to create a model update that contains the malicious uh, behavior, but also perform um, well on the benign task. Then the attacker scales its uh, malicious update using a scaling factor to overpower the aggregation step. So practically replacing the global model with their adversarial input. Uh, this is actually not a new problem. So we know that linear aggregation rules are vulnerable to Byzantine behavior. This has been extensively studied in the context of distributed machine learning. Here where we have a single Byzantine worker can force the parameter servers to choose an arbitrary vector even one that is too large in amplitude or too far in the direction from the other vector. But this problem is also known to us in the security domain, at least in the context of private data collection. 
Here we have that some of the clients will actually uh, send a value that is very large instead of sending the, the, the correct value. And in security, the general approach we have is that we generally use zero knowledge proofs um, in order to solve this problem. So, um, so the, well, we force the clients to prove that their submission is well formed. So, but the question here is what a well-formed client submission and federated learning would look like, at least in the context of scaling attacks. So because these attacks rely on scaling a model update, if we inspect the updates of a malicious client, you would notice that they are much uh, larger than the updates of benign clients. And therefore the natural question, can we prevent a model replacement attack by simply enforcing a bound on the norm uh, of the client? And indeed, model replacement attacks, we see that norm bound can be effective. But would norm bound be as effective to mitigate other stronger attacks we have seen in the literature? So this has been uh, and well debated in some of the recent work, each showing different results on the success of the norm bound preventing attacks known in FL. I think what is more important here is to try to understand what enables these attacks. Yes, there is a class of powerful attacks that exploits vulnerability in the linear aggregation rules and by employing scaling. And of these, uh, for these types of attack, norm bound actually seems to be an effective solution, but not all attacks exploit this vulnerability. Uh, actually, most advanced attacks exploit the nature of learning, making it harder to defend against them. And this brings me to the long tail discussion, which is somehow inevitable. So modern data sets uh, follow a classical uh, long tail uh, distribution, where a significant fraction of the data, uh, okay, of the data set consists of a rare, noisy, and atypical samples located at the long tail of the distribution. And it is now known uh, to us that large over uh, learning models uh, tend to allocate a large, uh, part of their model capacity to memorize and learn these sparse long tail data samples. The long tail uh, and memorization in relation to data privacy has been extensively studied because it's in part what allows the model to reveal sensitive data. So specifically tra rare trained data from the tail uh, subpopulation are prone to memorization. But this learning behavior also has implication on robustness. So it seems it is what enables these models to embed factors in the model from a few poison samples. So if models generalize well, then we would hope that this type of behaviors can be possible. Um, so to, these, to see this more clearly, so we analyze uh, the effectiveness of the norm bound on model poisoning attacks on different types of attack targets. We focus on prototypical attacks targets and tail attack targets. And we see that for, for prototypical targets, uh, even an attacker that is selected in each round can actually, with the norm bound, can be effective. This is not the case for the tail target. So this, uh, uh, we see that actually attack that is selected in a few rounds can already uh, embed, allow the model to learn that behavior associated with these uh, uh, data poisons. Uh, so, so this suggests that it may be a good idea to suppress the tail. Well, several approaches to suppress the learning from the rare samples, such as regularization, noise addition through differential privacy and compression exist. But unfortunately, it's a bit more complicated than uh, this. So when we optimize uh, for one thing, we can have unforeseen complication for other properties we care about. <coughs> we see that these solutions can impact uh, fairness. And today, it remains opaque, the interaction between the model design choices we make and all these desirable properties that we may or want uh, our model actually to fulfill. The, we need more work at the interactions to study these interactions. I'd really love to talk more about this topic, uh, but these two uh, people have done a really amazing job of highlighting these issues, and I'll just leave these resources for you to check. So, Really, our understanding of this issue suggests that as of today, we don't have defenses against all attacks. Maybe this is, might not be really an, an achievable goal, but some majors uh, we have are useful despite their limitation, and we need to proceed with stringing system with these, uh, with these majors as we have a better understanding of these issues. 
And this brings me to the norm bound as a defense. So this major indeed helpful for a class of powerful attacks. Let's proceed to see how this actually can be transfer to the secure uh, settings. Um, I don't have time to go through the protocol, but I will give you the gist of the protocol. So we actually, the, the gist of this protocol is actually applying zero knowledge proofs to problems like FL is almost, like it's a paramount challenge. I mean, these, these construction are very, very expensive. And generally what we want to think, we think two things as we do this is first select this construction with a, the type of constraints we have. So basically we, we do, basically in, in, in this protocol, we try to use uh, cryptographic consumption that have nice properties such as additive cryptographic commitments that can give us both the, the additive property, which is the secure aggregation and still give us these type of commitments that we can prove certain constraint on it. But even with doing all this, this still very costly. And, and that really give us to the second line, which we often need, we need to think of the problem from the two spaces. And the other space we need to think about is basically what the ML we can do, because what we do is actually we can we prove certain properties about the submissions. And what we try to ask, can we, can we actually reduce the amount of checks we do? So with that, we look at different techniques such as compression, so project the space of what we want to verify in a small space and you know, verify on these, and that give us a lot of uh, performance gain while preserving and also use techniques like uh, probabilistic checking and, and so on. I'm sorry that I, I can't cover the protocol in details, uh, but I'll leave these resources for you. So there's an archive, the, uh, the paper on the archive, but also the framework of the analysis of the robustness of FL, if you want to play uh, with, with this and the protocol of uh, both are online, so you can check these. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So in the last part of the we have follow. What is it you want to prove? You want to prove the trainers have actually trained on their data by committing to the training algorithm. So that's what cryptographic commitment allow you to do. But then you want to prove certain. So that's commitments. Is just to make sure that you actually trained on these data. Yeah. That you, that's what cryptographic commitment often give you as a property. But then you use zero knowledge proofs on top of them. So what zero knowledge proofs allow you to do to verify any other property, whether that's a constraint. No, no, I, I know that. My, my question is, what is it you want to prove? So let me, let me understand. So we, we prove the bound on the norm. That's one, but you can no, have no, any- Zero knowledge proof. Do you want to prove that the trainer has actually run the training algorithm? Like, what is it you want to commit? No, we want to prove certain properties about the contributions of the clients that's what we try to do so generally mbc allow you to do verifying that you actually followed the protocol yeah. computation but that's costly and um in the fl we have we don't see like actually deviating from the protocol it's a, just aggregation it's just the scaling and the scaling can help with uh, norm bound is a well i don't want to say equivalent but give us the same sort of uh effectiveness let's say because the other thing, if you don't want to have a secure aggregation, you need to jump to nonlinear aggregation rules, and those implementing them in, sec in security using cryptography are very costly. So, yeah, it's, uh... But for proving that the aggregator is doing you wrong, that's easy. That's just a matrix multiplication. Proving that the, that the aggregator is indeed aggregating everybody. So I think, uh, if I answer correctly, the proof is that the norm of the message which is communicated to the by the client to the server is smart. So is that right? Bounded. Is bounded. Yeah. I mean, that's one type of proof. If the system allows you to do arbitrary type of constraints proof. It just you need to see which ones are actually meaningful for robustness. I mean, uh, so it should come from ML folks probably. But yeah, we, we more think of how to make this more efficient. If we can express these as a constraints and then can prove them, then that's also uh, another way of uh, collaborating in this space. Just a kind of high level comment about so statistics is full of robust statistics that people have borrowed for all kinds of purposes. And they're kind of like a priori constraints that if you run this method, I can guarantee you a priori, like a median is not going to, you can perturb half the data and all that. 
the other part of statistics is more the diagnostic side, which is that um, I'm going to fit a model with maybe a robust method with whatever, and then afterwards I'm going to do all kinds of diagnostics. I'm going to be able to tell you afterwards that, uh, hey, there was something wrong, and don't trust this model. And if you pass all the diagnostics, it's not a proof that it's a good model, but it suggests that you So that's a very important part of statistics, and I think ML people just don't do it all. There's almost no work on diagnostics in ML. But if you want to robustify a statistical pipeline, so there are no, I don't know if that's also, but there's a lot of deep, like a lot of work. I mean, so for example, some of the project we also inspired by folks at the ML trying to do is we do um, post deployment sort of at the test time certain cryptographic audits on the, mm -hmm. uh, and how we design this. One of them in the collaborative learning things we do is trace back who mm -hmm. was actually the source of these issues in a privacy concerning way. So, but, but again, that does not solve the learning, does it? It doesn't solve it, but I, I think you're absolutely, it's a great answer. Uh, uh, there is a post-processing yeah. where the statistics and the cryptography can, can, can cooperate yeah. more. Um, you know, a lot of times the statistics will do kind of um, bootstrappy kind of things. Like we'll look at subsets of the data and we'll refit again and again and again. And if there's a, one of the, a few of the models are really glitchy, yeah. that suggests there was a poison that was in but again, it's after the fact. You didn't guarantee that whatever the poisoning was, that I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm robust with that. You said I can detect it after the fact. And so this is maybe kind of already obvious, but just kind of a, using all your crypto tools and knowledge, this might be a place to focus a little bit more. Is that just so we do reassure that. Think me this afterwards. what we're now hitting is just post training, prior yeah. to take and do that in a privacy preserving way yeah. using cryptographic audits. Exactly. So that's, that's where right. we're hitting now. Okay, well, that's great. That sounds very promising. So are you mainly looking into like active model poisoning approaches or also situations where some clients might just have outliers in their data or kind of mistakes in their annotation? So again, this is a very, very good question that I would love to have an answer. Like, because this is also very, uh, it, it, it goes more, I think, in the literature of the tale, what is a typical, what is actually data that we have not enough representation furnace, or what is actually a poison. I don't think we really have a good answers for these yet. I'm not very sure. I'm not, I'm not no, but just to say, the time I spent in the industry, the tale is where you get all the money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, suppressing the tail would be a very, very bad idea. It's not revenue. a good idea. No, I, I agree. It's not a good idea, but it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's again, I would not be the person to solve these issues, but it's, it's again, it's something we need to know that all of these issues arise. I mean, I talk about robustness, but I mean, in the privacy space, this is the, it's a, also a huge issue because now. We, Differential privacy is not working as well as we want it, but that does not mean it won't. And there's a lot of advancement in how to be carefully adding uh, the, the, the noise as you understand the time better. So maybe we will have, a, the, at least in the privacy, we might have in the next few years, really nice breakthroughs in solving issues in the tail related to um, sensitive data. For robustness, this is telling that this is a poison and, and a typical and so on. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, but again, that would probably come from ML folks more than us. We just work on verifying, understanding these systems, and making these constructions scale to the ML space, translating them to the encrypted settings, and more of we understand the cost models and so on of the computation. Okay. Another question. Maybe we can take uh, questions. Thank you.